Welcome back to Disciple Science, I'm Dale Gentry. The story of Copernicus and Galileo and the eventual replacement of the Earth-centered geocentric model for a heliocentric view is often portrayed as the first major conflict between science and scripture. The secular world sees this story as a confirmation of the authority of science as the final arbiter of truth, and religious communities, well, we don't really like to talk much about it at all. It doesn't appear to reflect well on the behavior of religious authorities or on our understandings of scripture. As interesting as those topics are, today I want to talk about the most important lesson to be learned from this whole debacle, and it's probably not what you're thinking. Let's start with a quick recap. I'm elaborating on a video we made on the influence of heliocentrism and science in general on biblical interpretation. If you want to learn more about the science of why we are so convinced that we live in a heliocentric solar system, that's covered over here. And this video discusses the influence of that idea on biblical interpretation. But let's figure out what we should learn from this whole story. When Copernicus published his sun-centered model, he was working for the Catholic Church, and he even dedicated his monumental book on the revolutions of the celestial spheres to the Pope. So he wasn't overly concerned that his heliocentric proposal would cause problems in religious circles, and in fact, it didn't, or at least not at first. It caused a minor controversy, mostly among scientists, in part because it was a book written to scientists. It wasn't intended for a broad audience. Now, as Copernicus predicted, his book garnered little reaction from the Catholic Church, although it was eventually banned, but it wasn't until 73 years after the original publication. Why the delay? Well, we'll get to that. That's part of the story. Now, Galileo's more complex. He wasn't initially out to prove heliocentrism. He was just genuinely fascinated by the heavens. But many of his discoveries, he argued, were best understood through the heliocentric model of the solar system, and over time, he became a cheerleader for that position. Now, eventually, Galileo did famously encounter serious pushback from the Catholic Church for his advocacy. He was labeled a heretic, his books were banned, and he was put on house arrest for the remainder of his life. It's not hard to see why the science versus faith rhetoric took hold, but a closer examination will find that that view doesn't hold up. Now first, Galileo was not the only astronomer to push for heliocentrism. Kepler and other astronomers also advocated for that view, but they weren't punished for it. Why did they pick on Galileo. Some of this can be explained by something that happened between Copernicus and Galileo that will explain why one was published shortly after publication of his book, Galileo, and Copernicus was chastised much later. Let's go to a timeline. In 1543, Copernicus published his book and died months later. Now, Galileo published three famous books that touched on heliocentrism, Starry Messenger in 1610, Letters on Sunspots in 1613, and Dialogue Concerning Two Chief World Systems in 1632. Now, before Copernicus, in 1517, Martin Luther famously published the 95 Theses that launched the Protestant Reformation. The Reformation created tensions among Christians in what had been a fairly unified Catholic Church split into Protestant and Catholic. The Catholic Church had just lost roughly half of its community, and some blamed their relaxed response to dissent and controversy as part of what led to that split. So what was their response? Well, the Council of Trent between 1545 and 1563, which effectively put into writing the Church as the central authority on proper beliefs. Now at this point, heliocentrism didn't have overwhelming support. It was a mere opinion, and it was a conclusion that cast doubt on human ability to discern truth, and on what some saw as biblical certainties. So Copernicus published early in the Reformation and got minimal flack. 
Galileo's first controversial book supporting heliocentrism came out later in the Reformation and after the Council of Trent. Now, the Catholics had a committee of sorts called the Inquisition, whose job it was to deal with heresies, and they did see heliocentrism at this point as heretical. Now, the Inquisition had existed since the 13th century, but it was ramped up after the Reformation. So what did the Catholic Church do? The Inquisition did reprimand him in 1616 after the publication of those first two books. And at that time, it was an easy decision. It's tempting to criticize the Inquisition and suggest that they should have gotten in line with science, but there's no history at this point of scientific authority over the Bible or the church. So it would set a precedent that they were not eager to pursue. Now also, they were siding with the majority opinion of not just the Bible nerds, but also the majority of the astronomers at the time. So Galileo was censored by the Inquisition in 1616, and was he punished? No. He was just told to put the issue to bed, leave it alone, don't bring it up again. No punishment, we just don't want to hear anything more about heliocentrism. Now that all happened under Pope Paul V, who then died in 1621. After two short years of the papacy of Gregory XV, came Pope Urban VIII. Now Urban was an intellectual, a moderate on heliocentrism, and a personal friend of Galileo, who saw this as an opportunity to revive his campaign for heliocentrism. Now he discussed it with the Pope on numerous occasions, and the Pope said, Okay, okay, you can explore heliocentrism, but only as a hypothesis. You can't assert it as the absolute truth. So Galileo got to work on his book, Dialogue on the Two Chief World Systems, but his attempt at treating heliocentrism as a mere hypothesis was by most accounts a total failure. Any reader could plainly see that he was developing an argument for heliocentrism as the true account of the solar system. Now also, in his book, Galileo made a mockery of the Pope by creating a dim-witted character named Simplicio and assigning him the opinions held by the Pope. Now further, the book was published in Italian, not Latin, and this was seen as an attempt to reach as broad an audience as possible. So the Pope saw Galileo's book as undermining and humiliating him to as broad an audience as he could reach, which is not always a great career move. So Galileo was subject to the Inquisition again, and in 1633 at trial it became clear that it wasn't as much about biblical heresies as it was about insubordination and humiliation. The Pope was ticked. Galileo unconvincingly argued that his support of heliocentrism was unintentional, and at the end of the trial, he recanted his support for heliocentrism and said he supported Ptolemy's opinion on the stability of the earth and the motion of the sun. Now, Galileo was put on house arrest, where he lived for nine more years at his villa outside of Florence. He had regular visitors, and by most accounts, he had a, a pleasant life for someone under house arrest. He was able to continue his scientific work, but he was effectively silenced on the orientation of the heavens. So what should we learn from this story? Now first, transitions in worldview or scientific paradigms can be painfully slow, which can feel excruciating if you are certain that you are right. But don't be discouraged if people don't rush to accept your perspective. I trust that most Christians want to know the truth that the evidence will reveal the truth, and that the truth will ultimately be embraced by the church, but it may take time. It took 200 years for the books by Galileo and Copernicus to be taken off the list of banned heretical resources. It's only been 160 years since Darwin published On the Origin of Species. Now second, and most importantly, we eventually learned to interpret the scriptures and the scientific observation correctly but Galileo and the church both took the wrong route to that destination. Galileo wasn't persecuted for his science, but for his attitude. He earned a reputation for rudeness and arrogance. He talked down to those who didn't agree with him, and he took a passive-aggressive approach to insulting the Pope. Hmm, where could we possibly apply this idea? 
Some people believe that we are in the middle of another version of this same scenario where science, in this case evolution, is leading us to double check our interpretations of scripture. But we should learn from Galileo, both from his brilliant scientific mind, but also his failures at gracious communication. Read the room, Galileo. Talking down to those that don't agree with you is not productive. It's not helpful. It won't change their opinion and it won't open their minds. It's critical that our integration of good science with good biblical interpretation be done with grace and even kindness so that we can have dialogue, which is the most promising pathway to the truth. Thanks for your attention. Disciple Science is a nonprofit based in St. Paul, Minnesota. Everything we make is free and it's created to help you connect with God through God's creation. There are lots of ways to support us. You can like and comment on our various social media feeds. You can post a review of our podcast on Apple Podcasts, or we really hope you would share Disciple Science with a friend. And lastly, we're still at work on our end of the year fundraising push, and we greatly appreciate those of you who are donating to support the artists that are hard at work on the next animated videos. If you want to join them, you can give at our website at DiscipleScience.com.